Bit of respect for everybody that came here on time. We'll try and stick to uh, the times we uh, talked about, which was seven to nine o'clock. Um, I'm going to ask all the, the three candidates to introduce themselves to you. For some of you, it might be the first time that you met them. Others, uh, you know, you might be, you might already know them, but perhaps we'll hear something different. Um, do you want to start, John? And is that microphone on? Is that enough for you, or do you want to use both the microphones? Sure, okay, so John uh, Richardson is going to start first. Introduce your name, the name of your party, and then what you'd like to say. And take a couple of minutes. Thanks. Hi, my name is John Richardson. Um, I have actually uh, run before municipally and once federally as an independent candidate. I've lived in this riding actually a uh, short walk from here for this is the 27th year. So I'm very uh, entrenched in it and I uh, love living here very much. And uh, tonight I sit here uh, as an independent candidate uh, with a slightly different twist. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, basically the political process in Ontario, in Ontario and the elections have sort of turned into nothing but a, uh, say, a party for the, uh, the mainstream political parties, uh, resulting in a good deal of apathy. And uh, that has to be turned around. Uh, Canada in general and Ontario has an amazingly vibrant democracy. Uh, there are very few places in the world uh, where one can actually set up and register a political party sort of on a dime when there's an election. And that's in fact what has happened here because I sit here, although I am an independent candidate, as uh, one of the candidates of the newly formed Canadian's Choice Party, which is in fact a party, a coalition, sort of a grouping of independent candidates together. And uh, I certainly look forward to hearing your questions and talking about what it means to be an independent candidate and why that's extremely important for the country in general, for our Dan Forth in particular. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come here and uh, be a part of the political process and get to know your candidates a little bit better. I wanted to say that uh, it does make sense to do it at this time because this is a very serious election. It's a very serious time. And it's important that we give a lot of time, a lot of thought to our uh, vote this year. I also uh, want to thank the organizers for bringing this together tonight. And it's so great that we're also in a surrounding of our local church. Uh, the church is one example of many great community hubs that we have in the area. And they play a very important role. They bring us together. They uh, create a sense of community for us. They give a sense of belonging. They give us a place to have dialogue, to meet friends, and uh, for our neighborhoods. And this is really important. Community is actually really, really important to me. And that's why over the last 20 years, I have been volunteering in the community quite substantially. I've done things like creating Toastmasters clubs. I've been president of a board of directors for a condo corporation. And currently, I sit on the board of the Canadian National Exhibition. I also sit on the board of the Anglican United Refugee Alliance. And what we do is we help the sponsorship, which is done by some of the churches of refugees into Canada. And I'm also vice chair of an organization that provides about $75,000 of scholarships every year to Ontario University students. So those are just some examples of ways that I have impacted the community. And so I'm finding you today because I want to make an impact on a larger scale. So I want to run, I want to be your MPP for Toronto Danforth. I am your liberal candidate. And I'm doing it because I care deeply and I want to make a difference in a much more substantial way. So we're in front of ourselves tonight, we're in front, you're in front of us tonight, to uh, hear our thoughts. And I think it's very exciting because what I bring to you is great work experience, great community experience. I'm the only female engineer running in this election. I think the first female engineer in Queen's Park. So that great experience underpinned by a Liberal Party that has been doing great things for us for the last eight years. Just brings so much strength to our cause. I'd like to move that way forward, and I thank you for your time tonight. I look forward to a really great, positive discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, and thank you to the organizers of the, the big debate tonight. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for some time, and to me, this is the most important part of the political process and the most enjoyable.
proposal for myself, meeting you, meeting the voters. Really looking forward to your questions tonight. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I've been out in Toronto Danforth on this campaign, meeting thousands and thousands of residents, and I've been hearing your needs and concerns, working very hard, and this is a part of the process that I'm, I'm really looking forward to taking part in tonight. As you may know, Toronto Danforth is one of the greenest ridings in all of Ontario. We typically do very well in this riding, uh, and we're working very hard to continue that growth over this upcoming election. I am not only running as your Green Party MPP, I'm also a husband to my wife Sarah, I'm a father to my new son Sasha, who's only four months old, I'm executive director of a not-for-profit organization, and this is my, you may have guessed, this is a, I'm a first-time candidate, it's the first time that I've run for a political office, because I feel that now really is the time for change um, in Ontario and in this riding. I'm here tonight to speak about the platform and what I would do as, as your MPP. Uh, I feel that the Green Party platform is both forward-looking, realistic, and practical, and that our plan is really to support healthy and livable communities, sustainable transportation, clean and renewable energy, and an economic plan to create jobs for the 21st century. We have a very strong platform. So I'm looking forward to tonight. I hope that you find it informative. I hope that it helps you as you make your decision in the next week. The election uh, the date is coming up quite soon, and I, I look forward to taking your questions and, uh, and talking to all of you. Thank you very much. Okay, so just to remind you who the candidates are, we've got Tim Whaley, the Green Party, who you just heard from, Marisa Sterling, who's with the Liberal Party, John Richardson, who's with the Canadian's Choice Party, and uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Uh, go ahead, you're the campaign manager for... Uh, top, the only party. We're one of the eight parties that got newly registered in the last three weeks. So we, you haven't heard much of us as yet. Oh, yeah, now our candidate, Neil Mercer, is sitting outside because he's unable to enter this church inside because of uh, ramp uh, installation problems. Uh, so this shows, again, uh, this is the second Alcane Base meeting where we've been excluded because of lack of access. Now, the, um, my name is Michael Green, and uh, myself have run in many elections before, for the Green Party, actually, for the first 10 years, from 1983 to 1993. After that, I joined Tobias House which I've worked for for 20 years now at Coxwell and Danforth. It's a 24-hour attendant care for adults with physical disabilities. And your candidate, who's out there, Neil Mercer, he is a client of Tobias House. So he can live, even with his great disability and inability to breathe without a ventilator, he can live there independently and live a normal life. And as one of his workers as well, I'm able to help him prepare dinner, go to bed, suck him, run, and so on. So there are many people with disabilities in Ontario, and there needs to be definitely more attention in the health field for their needs. Uh, in I'd like you, most of you got this piece of paper when you came in. If you didn't, uh, you can hear about it. If you get up at 3 a.m. on Saturday morning, at that time there's a two minute broadcast where I'm, uh, I talk this um, information. So, not to say too much more, we have five principles that we stand for, and that's it. They are best practice, empathy, frugality, interdependence, and transparency. And when they're used as an MP who's a top MP, would make sure all the ministers under him in Parliament will act on these principles. So for example, one thing, we would be able to have the budget of the government when it's transparent and we can see all the intertwining links to all the different bureaucrats. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're going to go uh, pop in and out uh, when you have to, but thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you now. Nine candidates were invited to today's debate. Um, these are the people who have chosen to be here. Uh, the, the format is going to be if you have a question, raise your hand. We'll give you one of these cards. You can write your question down and come up to me and I will read it. It's pretty simple. Um, if there's a candidate you want to ask something specific to, please put their name here. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that you want to hear from everybody. Everybody will be given a chance to respond. We're going to stick to about two minutes per person. Uh, and keep in mind this is a debate. And what I find so often happens with debates is there's no real debate. It's more like a question and answer. But I invite the candidates, if there's something you really want to um, call one of the other candidates on, or if there's, you know, if you want to have some back and forth dialogue, then that's what we're here for. We're here to find out what the differences are between you, and obviously um, what you stand for and where your passion lies. So it's not about being, uh, it's not a Q&A, because people don't need everybody here. Hi there. Okay, we have a late camera, Kevin Clark, with the People's Political Party. You gonna have a seat? Yes, exactly. Great. So we have just gotten started, Kevin. So you've got, you wanna sit down and uh, in two minutes, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Perfect. I'll pass you this microphone. Well, Kevin Clark, I am the founder and the interim leader of the People's Political Party of Ontario. On the ballot, you will see it as the people. My leader is present, and these are the two cohorts. We answer to the children. We answer to the needs of humanity. And to answer to the child, you must put the needs of people first. My opponents seem to think this election is about the liberals, conservatives, and the new Democrats. It's about the politicians and the politics. No, this election is not about the politicians. It's about you. And that's why I'm here to represent you, the people. As your next member of provincial parliament, I have a vision. And that vision is to fulfill Jack Layton's last wish. is to work together to change this world. And to change this world, we must preserve a future for these young children, for the youth, and for the people of this province. And for us to do that, we must invest in the needs of people. We are investing in politics and in all sorts of other CRAP. And that won't stand well with me. I slept on the streets of Toronto. I eat out of the garbage. I've gone through the criminal justice system. I've ran a business in this country. And I know what the needs of the people are. We need a government to serve us first. And God bless us all. Thank you. All right, so uh, Kevin, what you missed is that I've got questions from the audience. That's where I'm going to get my questions. And everybody has about two minutes to answer. OK, and I'm just going to uh, rotate through you to see who, who answers first, so there isn't like a constant order, OK? So shall we get started? OK, good. Uh, all right, so the first question. Reducing corporate taxes continuously over the last several years has not worked for job creation. Is your party willing to increase taxes on the wealthiest corporations to reduce the deficit and fund programs? Let's start with Tim. Can I keep the, the question answered? Because really quick. Uh, are you prepared to raise taxes on the wealthiest in order to uh, fund the services we need? Sure. Um, I think that, that we are quite uh, straightforward in, in our approach in that area. We have a, a tax plan which is to uh, to to shift some of the tax burden onto industry that, that is, on companies that have high level of uh, greenhouse gas emissions are the polluters. Uh, we have, we're, the only, we're the only party that really would impose a carbon tax. We're very open about that. Uh, we, we feel that that's a fiscally responsible approach that we could eventually balance the budget by 2015, which is a much more aggressive target than the other parties. And we would delay uh, tax cuts on corporations for the first year of the plan. Uh, for the first year or two. Uh, but basically that is, that is kind of a summary of our approach. There is a cost to, to polluting. We want to make industry aware of that cost. And we want to make it easier for families and for small businesses. So we lower the tax rates on small businesses and families and, 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 and shift some of that, that cost over to, uh, to a carbon tax. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. 
Okay, so thank you very much for the question. I guess the question is talking about tax, and there's a couple things I want to share. So one is the Ontario level is what we have done, in fact, is lower income taxes for Ontarians, because nine to ten Ontarians now have a lower income tax rate. The other thing that I want to talk about in terms of businesses is let's look at Toronto Danforth. In Toronto Danforth, we're made up of small businesses, mostly small businesses. Those are really the fuel and the engine of our economy. And that's sort of where we're, we see ourselves going forward with small businesses. And that's why it is important to fuel and encourage the small businesses. And that's why you'll see that as Ontario Liberals, we have taken down the tax rate on small businesses and will continue to do that to the rate of 4%. It makes good sense. And it's actually already proven. This has already been happening. Because it's been happening, we have created jobs in Ontario. So it's very important to look at a proven strategy and just continue on track that same strategy, which is working. Thank you for your question. John, John Richardson. Thank you. You repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, so re reducing corporate taxes uh, continuously over the past several years has not worked for job creation. Is your party willing to increase taxes on the wealthiest corporations to reduce the deficit and fund programs? I don't believe that taxation should be for the purpose of discriminating against people based on, or discriminating against companies based on how much money they make. I think that what you do is you establish a corporate tax rate and all corporations pay it by virtue of being a corporation. Not everybody has to carry on business as a corporation. So in other words, I would not have different tax rates for different kinds of corporations and I probably would consider even abolishing what is the uh, the first uh, couple hundred thousand or whatever that will either get tax free. Now the second question, part of the question, had to do with raising taxes. I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because it seems to me that if one wants to attract business in Ontario, the number one issue is that taxes in Ontario have to be lower than taxes in other jurisdictions to ensure that business comes to Ontario. So, raising taxes, maybe yes, maybe no. That said, I think there's absolutely no evidence that low taxes in and of themselves create jobs. Third question, part of the question, had to do with the relationship between taxes and the deficit. The, the deficit exists because of too much spending. It is absolutely ridiculous to approach the deficit or think of the deficit totally in terms of we're going to go out and tax corporations or people without considering spending cuts and I think that the bigger issue when it comes to that is, in fact, the spending cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got Kevin Clark. Well, first, I'd like to thank you thousands of people for showing up tonight. And you laugh when I say thousands, but you are really thousands of people. Thank God for Facebook and Twitter, because tonight you can use them to your greatest asset to bring your true member of parliament home. Will I tax corporation? I don't think it's about the corporation that matters, because the corporation is poor and they don't have enough money and we only tax them, then that corporation go out of business and we lose a large amount of jobs. So I will not tax corporation, I will tax profit. So if you are a corporation that is making profit, then we will tax according to the profit that you make. If you're a corporation and you're in debt, we're not going to tax you extra because if we do, it's going to cost us the people in the end because we're going to lose a lot of jobs when that corporation go out of business or when that corporation fought for bankruptcy. So we're going to tax the profit, the profit of corporations or companies that are funded by taxpayers' dollars. I have seen so many businesses out there who are making a large amount of profit by using taxpayers' money as bailouts, and those are situations that must change. So we will tax the profit, not the corporation. God is with us. Thank you. Okay, and here from the, uh, the only party, Michael. Well, when the only party elects 107 members of parliament, you will see what will happen. First of all, we're not revolutionary. We will stay with the status quo, but slowly improve all the things that 
our ministers are supposed to do and improve. Now, when it comes to taxes, I would say we don't have to change the, immediately, as I say, the dis distribution of money, because it's mostly a, mostly a, sent, a, a case of bad management. One of our five principles is transparency, and when you can see through all the bullshit, you'll know where to put it. Good fertilizer. And the taxpayer should decide where to distribute the taxes, not the politicians and their advisors and special interests. We should also, for people who are so-called poor, do what uh, Pierre Trudeau did. It called, back in the early 70s, he created the LIP, Local Initiative Program, where bids were put out, the government paid for people to create jobs, not for bureaucrats to make dead-end jobs. Then Dennis Mills had a good idea, a liberal, for the single tax, so that corporations and individuals can be taxed at a percentage that is fair. Okay, what did the Warren Buffett? We should, if we do anything, there should be no coercion. Anything that's ethical has to be voluntary. And we need more Warren Buffett millionaires in Canada or Ontario to give back to the public. So, okay, as I said, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's okay. all. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody yeah. gets a chance to speak. Marisa, you have something that you want to add? Thanks very much. I, I just want to pick up on a couple of points made by my colleagues. There were two things that were said. One was around process, government process. One was around deficit. So if I could just briefly speak to those two things. The first around process. So I just want to make sure that people are aware, you probably already know this, that as an Ontario Liberal government, we already are looking inside, internally, and are looking at the public sector and are looking at what we need to do to uh, make things more efficient, and that's going to result in a 7% cut within that. So we've already been looking about how we can make things more efficient and more effective, so we realize that that's an important thing. The other comment was around deficit. So I just want to touch on that very briefly. So as you're all aware, when the chair liberals came into power in 2002, we inherited a deficit. We eliminated that deficit in three years. Then we were in a recession. So then the decision was made, what do we do in a recession? What we did is we kept the province going. So we did accumulate a deficit so that we could keep the province going, that we could have healthcare education for us and job creation. And now we're working to a plan to reduce that. And we're completely on track to that plan. And we're so focused and so prudent and so open and transparent on that plan that all that we have going forward is fully funded because of how we're being efficient going forward. So just want to be very clear and very upfront about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next question. Uh, I was going to start with you, Marisa, but it seems unfair since you just finished talking, so I'll start with um, John. Uh, what do you think is the most pressing issue for the constituents in this riding? So what's your number one priority? What do the people here sitting in this room and living in this riding need the most from their MPP? John? Well, that's a very easy question. What they need is an MPP that actually uh, sees his or her job as representing the people in the riding and not being beholden uh, to a political party from where they take their orders. And uh, th this is the reason why we have such tremendous apathy. It's the reason why we, in fact, do not have the thousands of people here tonight that Mr. Clark was talking about. People don't care because they don't think they matter. The reason they think they don't matter is because the mainstream political parties do nothing but simply perpetuate their own existence and, they, and the, uh, the individual MPPs simply take their orders, their walking orders, from the party leaders. Evidence of that? Where's the conservative candidate tonight? Answer? Representation. Plain and simple. Kevin, you want to go next? 
text and then tell us what you think the most pressing, pressing issue is. Well, naturally, the most pressing issue is one that I'm the greatest of an expert at. Like, I've been a former grade 5 student teacher at Chester Lee Junior Public School, and, you know, in my days in the streets of Toronto, I have always been called a preacher, I've been called a teacher, I've been called many different names, and one of them has been called Jesus, so God is with us. But the most pressing issue is what leads to the party being called the people. Who makes the people? The people don't exist without the children. So the number one issue is children's rights. And I'm very appalled that there are my opponents, the politicians from those political parties, would have been dodging that issue all election. Rob Ford dodged it during the mayor of Toronto's race and would not debate me. And when I returned, even from poor health, you still dodged me. Why would you not let the people choose who their next member of parliament is? The children have a right, and the people have a right, and politicians, you will know in the last week of this election that there are thousands of people here tonight because they will hear the word of the right, and that's the people, the people, the people. They are the owners of government. The most pressing issue in uh, in this area, yeah, I would I would say is a combination of health and transportation. Uh, as you can see right here, we can't get our candidate into this room, and it's not only that uh, wheel trans cannot find a ride for him to go back home, so we have to call a private taxi to get him back home. And it's, it's arriving at 10 o'clock, not at 9 o'clock. And as by uh, my fellow candidate, uh, Kevin, he says the, uh, one of the big problems here is, as well, leadership. Our party does not believe in the traditional leadership model. Everyone, when elected to parliament, will be a leader. There will not be a beneficent dictator in this party. And all our members of parliament have to pass a polygraph test that they are not liars that everybody perceives them to be when I see them on the sidewalk saying, signing nomination papers. Well, we don't know you here. How do we know that we like to be all the other liars? So we want to stop having politicians being down at the bottom of the totem pole. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Hello? Yeah, it's talking. Sorry, nobody can hear me through the microphone. Speak closer. Hello? Oh, there we go. Okay. You think I'd be better at this by now, right? <laughs> uh, well, I, it's a very interesting question. Um, local, you know, we're, we're, we're in a very heated political environment right now in the city, in the city of Toronto. And I think that that is sort of spilling over into provincial politics. A lot of people have a lot of thoughts about Rob Ford. He's a very uh, polarizing figure in, in our city. And some of the issues that he's been dealing with, I'm getting a lot of questions about the Portlands, about transit city, about the transportation in the city, about the health. I would really pick up on what Michael had mentioned. Transportation and health, to me, I would I completely agree with Michael are the issues that I'm hearing about the most, which are, are on, on people's minds. Um, I'm somebody who has has attempted uh, and successfully so far to get around on transit and on my bicycle. I don't own a car, uh, and that's 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 getting more difficult. Um, you know, there's a possibility of transit tra transit fares going up. We have to make it easier for people to live those types of lifestyles. We have to provide tax incentives for transit users. We have to invest in, in infrastructure to make walkable, cyclable communities. We have to make that a priority because that not only speeds up transportation, deals with the gridlock, which is really bad in the city. It also promotes a healthy lifestyle, which will have implications for our healthcare system, bring down costs in our healthcare system. So I think it's a, it's a, something that's, pit, that's really connected with people. I'm getting a lot of people really agreeing with me. You know, that's something that is, that is important to me. Um, and, and that's something that I'm hearing at the door. So, yes, thank you. Thanks for the question. Great question. Thank you. Marissa? Where are we going um, I would agree that this is a great question, and I would also agree that uh, you're hearing some great answers. Um, so I'm going to uh, add to that by saying that what I hear at the door 
is that we need great local leadership, but we also need great provincial leadership. And I think that's a really important thing to talk about. So what we need in this riding, in our community, is we need leadership with regards to our education, our health care, our job creation, and our environment. Which means that at the door, people are saying to me, they need leadership at the schools to make sure that, for example, fully kindergarten gets implemented, more students graduate, really important. We need leadership at the hospital. As I met with the CEO of our local hospital, he acknowledges we need leadership and support for our local community hospital, that it is there for us and we trust it when we need it. We need support for jobs. When I talk to people at the door, people need help, they need jobs, they need work, they're looking for work, they need skills retraining. And these are things that, that uh, we, we, we have been supporting and continue supporting, but we need to continue to advocate and lead at that level. And on the environment, we need to keep taking leadership levels on the environment, continue with our no small that we've had this year. So it's really important that we basically raise the bar. So I'm here at the door, that we, we are looking, that we need to look someone to raise the bar and have us as a stronger leader representation on the provincial level, because those are the issues that this world is here to serve you for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about transportation, uh, and uh, Kevin, you can answer this one first. Question is, it's estimated that congestion costs the GTA economy billions of dollars a year. We also have some of the longest commute times in the world. Long commutes are bad for the health, the environment, and overall quality of life. As our MPP, what would you do to address transportation issues in Toronto, the GTA, and the Golden Horseshoe. Well, okay, try it. I think you, you know, I'm, I'm an expert on that issue. Aside from, uh, you know, even I thought a TTC and me get here this evening with two different detours at two times it was short term. Okay, and I took a photo and I'll be posting it on the People's Political Party on Facebook. And I thought that was the biggest torture until I came here and met one of my political opponents. And Marissa, by God, you're killing me. But because I love you all, I'm going to stay here. Because you know, even torture like that, we have to stand up again. For transportation, transportation is one of our greatest assets. But I find we're spending a lot on transportation and taking a lot longer for us to get from point A to point B. I find that when it gets towards the north end of the city, it gets extensive. And we have to start moving people out from the downtown core and spreading them out across the city. Because with Rob Ford's plan of cutting 70 million some million dollars off services, we're going to have a lot of people who are going to be without. And we think a lot of people are going to have to commute a lot more. I don't know all the answers, but I do know we get the buses and all those buses that we cut from the bus route. I think that would have been an asset if we did not cut transportation to certain areas. I believe that we can start from the borders of Toronto and we will charge, uh, we, can either, we can either charge a toll for people who are coming into the city. If you are above a certain income level, so if you are at a certain income level, then naturally we're not going to charge you a toll, but once you're at an income level to where you're comfortable in your life and you're able to handle, handle the extra expense, then if you're coming from Ajax, Oshawa, Pickering, and all that area, then you will pay a toll for you to come into the city to work. But we'll also encourage agreements between other municipalities. Say, for example, if we have 10,000 people coming from outside Toronto to work at Toronto City Hall, then we will talk about exchange programs where we will exchange, we will exchange our city worker for your city worker because your city worker lives in your area. So that will kill the commute time. So we only have 5,000 people coming into the city and we don't have these people having to go out there to work okay. at We're going to have to wrap that up now. Thank you. I Interesting love. idea. Uh, Michael, do you want to respond? Um, yes, uh, basically, uh, we would do things as the rhetoric of the Greek party suggests and also the NDP and uh, put much more emphasis and have the political will to address transportation by having more electric vehicles and making it mandated, not just a rhetoric, nicey, nicey, cushy, you know, flower power statement, but actually enact laws that start with the most uh, pollution-free vehicles and give them priority over 
the gas guzzlers that are simply, we should have, a, put this way, a true car-free city and have public transportation that's electric. Thank you. I'm glad that, I'm glad that we, uh, we came back to this question because this is a very important question. And, and I think I put the question to you. I mean, are you satisfied with transit in the city and do you feel that the Liberal government under Dalton McGinty has invested enough money in transit in the city? We know this is that Toronto is the economic engine of, of Ontario and Canada. And we know that uh, the gridlock in our city is, 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 is hurting our economy, it's hurting our environment. It's hurting, it's hurting us in, in many, many ways. And this is a key area for the, for the Green Party of Ontario. And Michael and I seem to have a lot, a, a lot to say about this. And we want to make it easier for you to, uh, to afford to buy an electric vehicle. We want to make it easier for you to take public transit. We want to make it easier for you to get around the city in sustainable, environmentally friendly ways. Um, and I, don't, I, I personally, as a, as a voter, as a resident of this area, as someone who relies on public transit, I'm not happy with what the Liberals have done uh, for public transit. Um, and, and the NDP, I, mean, I, I wish that uh, Mr. Tappan's could have made it today to, to speak on this issue, because I'm really curious what he has to say about that as well. As we know, transit is, is, is primarily about moving people around, but it's also about our environment. Um, and, I, and I'm sure that we'll be getting into, uh, into green issues a little bit uh, tonight, but I'd like to hear what uh, Mr. Tappan's has to say about that. I don't know if you're aware, but um, I've recently discovered that the David, David Suzuki Foundation has compared the NDP environmental uh, platform to the Conservative Party. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism of the uh, of the green platform uh, for the NDP, and we're actually I'm actually finding door to door that I'm finding a lot of NDP people are coming over uh, to the Green Party as well as Liberals and, uh, and Conservatives. So it's a big issue. Uh, it's crucial for the city, but it's crucial for the whole province. Um, it's a lot a lot of communities that are, are facing these issues. So great question. Um, I'm really really uh, good questions tonight, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Marisa. It's definitely a fantastic question. So let's look at um, where we've been and where we're going. So as an Ontario Liberal Party in the last eight years, we've made the biggest infrastructure investment since the last 40 years. We've made $62 billion, it's a huge number, but we've made a huge infrastructure investment, the largest in the last 40 years. Transportation. What Ontario Liberals have done is they've invested $10.8 billion in public transportation in the last eight years. Half of that money has been here in Toronto. So the clear recognition is that absolutely we have a, a, an issue facing us and it needs to be addressed. So we have started to address it. So we put half of that money into Toronto to start to get Toronto moving even better. So where do we go from here? Of course we can always do more. So we've shown our commitment, where do we go from here? Well as Ontario Liberals, we have committed to, within the Metrolux plan, to the Crosstown Edmonton LRT. We have committed to this banana extension. We've committed to the link to the airport. So these are parts of the puzzle to help to get Toronto moving. As well, going forward, we are introducing two-way all-day go service. This is huge. When I talk about this to people at the door, it's huge. Because when you want to go and take a job that is outside the perimeter of Toronto and the TTC limits, but you don't want to leave your community, this is where you have your friends and family and you want to stay, now you have the chance to use the two-way go service, all-day service, and you can actually take that job that is outside the city. So that's a very, very Time. substantial improvement. So let me just add two other things that I heard. Can I then respond? Great point. Yeah, do you want to respond to what someone else has said? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I'm just going to respond to two things I heard. So one, I heard about electric car, so I'm very excited about the fact that in, that the Toyota plant in Ontario is producing electric cars. That's been something that we have worked really hard to encourage that investment in Ontario and that they are one of the ones producing electric cars. That's, I think, a great accomplishment because I do concur with the comments here. Sorry, I don't know. I will. I do. Rock it yeah, no. Sorry. And then the last one was about the... That's okay. Well, I thought you were responding to something that someone said about you. If these are just additional points, we're going to have to cap it, sorry, because I just got it's a two minute limit, sorry. Nothing personal, but I want everybody to have a chance. Um, okay, so, now I'm confused. That would be cool. There we go, John, you go. Okay, so does anybody have an iPhone with a stopwatch? Because I don't have, look at maybe a two minute sign. Does anybody want to volunteer to be the, okay, you get the two minute sign. Well, the gentleman in the red puts his hands up, so I don't get to be the bad guy. That means you get two minutes. That means please, please try and wrap it up. Thanks. John, you're on. The question. Your question. question. 
You don't remember the question? No, I'm only kidding. The question, I think, had to do with the relationship between question, congestion, and cost. Am I right? It's to do with how are you going to get the city moving? How are you going to get, uh, get, get rid of the gridlock? What is your exact plan? There is no way to get, gridlock, get rid of gridlock next week, next month, next year, or anything close. That's cars. The word is fewer. Yeah. You're not going to be able to do that in the short run. What is required, though, is an absolute commitment to do it over a 10 year period or a 12 year period or something like that. People always overestimate what they can do in one year and always underestimate what they can do in 10. Last year, about this time, I was in, I was in China and I visited both Beijing and Shanghai. You would not believe how effectively, how efficiently, and how purposefully they've managed to create a fantastic public transit system in that city. And there is less congestion from cars in both Shanghai and Beijing than there is today in Toronto. The Toronto Board of Trade has made it clear that the problem is so severe in this city that it is eventually going to impact the economy extremely negatively, as well as people's health. Now, what specifically is to be done in Toronto? One, cycling, and this will appeal to those who are interested in the green aspect of this, which I do support in a general way, needs to be integrated in a much bigger way into what's happening. Certainly, the big city, or whatever it's called, these new cycling things are tremendous move in that direction. Two, the way subways two, two relate. Minutes. Two minutes? Your two minutes are up. Oh, okay. So can, if you could just have a sentence to wrap it up. What you need is a European-style subway system where people get on the subway without having to worry about paying, and then what you do is you have police to monitor it so people get in and out of the subway as quickly. I took the subway, I was at Bloor Station today, and had to walk around about 300 feet of a barricade just to order people into the right. subway. You don't see that anywhere else in the world. Thank you. I'll start giving one-minute warnings. Yeah, that's a good idea. You get a one-minute warning, so you know in the back of it. Good job. Go I appreciate that. Okay, so today uh, an Ontario farmer was found guilty for distributing um, and uh, make, producing and distributing a raw cow's milk. The government was uh, uh, took him to court. He lost. So the question is, if elected, what will you do to help remove some of the nanny state policies of the current administration? Do you want to take that, uh, Kevin? You want to start with that? You don't even know. Yeah. Well. I was pretty close to this milk debate, and I was supposed to assist them uh, when they all started back up in Newmarket. And at that point, I was being attacked by the Toronto Union because I was a homeless man who spoke out loud, and they went to Rob Ford to be mayor and all these other things. And they figured that you weren't intelligent to know when you're hearing truth and when you're seeing hard work. Right now, I for that I agree that you know milk in that state should be. You're going to check on it to see what type of chemicals. If you use chemicals on your animals or things, I can understand that the government steps in. But if there's no chemicals and the cows are raised naturally and you're drinking the milk, then I do not think that there should be any laws against it. Right? That's from my, my own personal view. But I would rely on the people to give me guidance on whatever I do. You have to remember, I'm not from a political party. I am from the people's political party because we are not political, but we only got political to protect your political interests. So if we have to get political to defend your rights, then that's what we are going to do. I have been through Ellen back through all sorts of different organizations, $231 million spent on homelessness, but I didn't get off the streets of Toronto as a homeless mine by one cent of those services. The United Way and all these agencies are collecting millions and they save for homelessness, but the only way I got off the street off homelessness is Time. Wrap it up. It's okay, but oh. I say time, so you wrap it up. Okay, so basically I rely, I rely on the people to lead me, right? You have to remember, I am a servant to you. I answer to the child, and whatever is in your best interest is in the interest of child is in my interest. Tracy Kevin, right? That's next we're going to move on to uh, Michael representing the only party. Uh, should the, you know, how are you going to get the 
stop the government from telling us what we can or cannot eat or drink. That's an excellent question. And uh, the top party, the only party, believes that no, there should be no coercion by government or private or any force. And uh, what we, we believe in affirmative action, citizens' ability to make decisions or citizens' arrest based on the criminal code. We should also be able to vote, as the federal government does, the notwithstanding clause and opt out of whatever the state mandates us to do, provided we don't only assert our rights, but also assert with the provision of responsibilities, which means that if you get sick drinking unpasteurized milk, that's your cost to absorb, not the majority who, are, who want to impose it on you. It's a matter of human rights. So, so and we're saying, invoking Jack Layton's statement about love, hope, and optimism. When we keep that in mind, that is what the top party's uh, second value is, is empathy. Bringing some spirituality into our civil discourse. Thank you. Watch, don't forget to watch the timer. Be aware of your time. Thanks. Excellent. Another excellent question. Um, and I think that this may be a, a different, uh, difference between the Green Party of Ontario approach and the Liberal approach, particularly when it comes to, uh, to, to green energy, to, uh, to our energy policy. The Green Party is all about empowering and supporting our local communities to make smart decisions, to, to gain local benefits, um, and local ownership of, uh, of, of, of energy projects at the local level. So we would provide better access to, to a, a new smart grid uh, for local communities, for rural communities, um, in terms of energy projects. And um, we would support uh, responsible stewardship in rural, rural communities, which benefits our, our air, benefits our water. And I think that the, the liberal approach, uh, signing backroom deals with large multinational corporations uh, on energy projects which are, which are imposed on communities without that, Public input without the consultation is, uh, is is not is not successful. We're hearing on the news all the time of people uh, community. There's a blowback from the community to to uh, tur wind turbine projects. Um, and the other thing is that I, I I hear a lot door to door that people feel that the Liberal Party hasn't completely delivered on green issues. There's a somebody mentioned rhetoric. Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric um, going around, but. The original goal of 2007 to get off of coal wasn't delivered. That's now being pushed to, I mean, believe 2014. Our plan is to get off of coal right, right away. Um, so we, yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I guess I'd sign and pass it on now. Yeah, okay. and I just remind uh, people to answer the question. The question was, how, how are you going to work to have the government step away from telling people what they can and cannot do? First, I don't know if that's exactly what you answered. Right, right. Is that well, yeah, I mean, I, I, think I, I, I think I did answer. I think that we, as I, as I mentioned in, in a broad sense, I unfortunately am not too familiar with this particular example, and I wish that I, I had a chance to, to, to investigate a little bit further, and I was speaking more generally about... Right, so it's about the freedom of choice, letting people... Yes. Uh, sink or swim, get sick, don't get sick if you drink unpasteurized milk. It's right. the idea of, you know, needing protection from the government to... The nannies, you know, the nanny. Right, right. Well, I think there is a role for, for a government uh, to provide certain standards and guidelines in terms of health, health and safety of our communities. But there's, import, there's an important role of communities in, in, this, in this discussion. Um, it is a discussion, and it's an evolving situation. And um, I think there's not actually an easy answer to it to these questions, and, and I'm glad that we're, we're having an opportunity to talk about it. But um, I think that, as I mentioned, there's import, important, uh, there is a need for, for some guidelines and standards, and there is a role for, for government. So, I hope that helped answer the question, but I'm going to pass it on to someone else. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you. Marisa? Thank you very much. Um, I think the question is for raw milk and farmers. So, I'm going to talk about that. Um, so, in terms of raw milk, well, we have Health Canada, and Health Canada is a federal body, and they set some regulations and guidelines around the food that we eat, things we drink, etc. 
And that's a good thing, because I don't think all of us in the room can spend our time becoming experts around these sorts of things. We do want someone that's making sure that we can trust what we get at the grocery store. So this is a great question because, again, we can always learn and we can always do more. I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer. I recognize that information research comes out, changes, and we need to evolve with it. If there is some new research, some new information out there that we need to look at, and we can make decisions based on facts, and therefore we have changes that make sense, then that would be the perfect thing to do. This question, I think, is uh, not necessarily just with the, with the provincial level. It sounds like it also has to do with interacting with the, the member here working with the federal level in order to affect those, those things. I have one minute left. So I think the other part of the question is about farmers. Let me talk to you about farmers. We have three fabulous farmers markets in this riding. And it's a great thing that we have them. And we have them because we support the local farmers. We support the farming uh, economy. We support the fact that you can buy your local, your food locally. That is only good for the economy, only good for farmers, and only good for preserving farmland. So I think this is a great uh, thing that we have and a great way to move forward. So we're protecting the farmers, and we can also look at, uh, in terms of any standards, around the quality and safety of our food. So thanks for the questions. Thank you, Marisa. John? The question has to do with preserving freedom choice? The answer is simple. We get rid of the existing government. Okay. For a start. Which has been extremely interventionist. Now, not everybody may want to get rid of the existing government, and that is, of course, what part of freedom of choice is about. But a lot of people don't want freedom of choice. The reason they don't want freedom of choice is because it implies that people have to take responsibility for their lives. So I think that's the real question. Do you want to take responsibility or not? If not, continue to vote for political parties that are going to perpetuate the use your words, the nanny state. If you do want to take responsibility for your lives, which implies that you create an opportunity for yourself to move onwards, upwards, forwards, then send a strong message in this and every election that you do, in fact, want freedom of choice. The milk issue is not the real issue. It's simply a symptom of an overall. Thank you. I'm Kevin. You don't need the mic. Yes, uh, my, when we talk about this milk issue, some of it just came to light. And why it is not proper for the government to tell this man that this cannot be done is if this is a private farmer and if these are individuals who are of your free will decide to purchase from this individual. So this individual is not selling in the stores or in their vaults. I think that people should have the free will to choose whether they're going to purchase off him or not. And it brings to light the man in the right who has a little tomato farm. So the government is going to tell you that you can't drink this milk or you can't give it to your friends or sell it to your friends. Or you're going to tell me that I grow my little tomato patch and you're going to want to sit down there and please my tomato farm too. So Kevin, if elected, what would you do to change that? I would see that when it comes down to overall where everyone in the public have access to Product, that it is under government control. But if it's a personal choice by individuals, I do not believe that government has a right to impose on the personal choice of the individual. So if you're elected, I, what would you do to change that? What would I do? I would, I would contest and I would appeal the ban of this man's southern past rights. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. What is your position on nuclear power in Ontario? Marisa, you want to start with that one? Uh-oh. I'm going to start by saying that we need our lights on. Very important. So the question is, how do we do that? So we know that we want to move ourselves forward to renewable green energy technologies. It's the way of the future. It's the best thing for us, for our environment, for our health, for our future. So that is a, is a given, and I think most of us would agree with that. So now the question is, how do we get there? So the question is around nuclear. Well, we need to have the lights on. We need the hospital to work when we need it. It's an important thing. So how do we, what do we do about that? We have two major sources of energy that we started from, coal and nuclear. And as a local government, we have made the commitment to get out of coal. And we've been very clear about that, and we're moving forward on doing so. And I'm glad that my Green Party candidate uh, colleague to my, to my right here, I mean, I'm sorry, I brought that up because about David Suzuki, because yes, David Suzuki has come out 
and spoken very publicly in July of this year to say, Ontario Liberals, you're doing a great thing with the environment where you're going in the future, you're going at the poll which we agree to. The question was therefore, what about nuclear? Well, I can tell you nowhere in the world are they out of coal and out of nuclear. You're either in coal, out of nuclear, you're in nuclear, out of coal. So, we made a commitment to be out of coal, and now where we're going. So now where we're going is we're making those investments to create new renewable green energy. So that is the way that we want to transition ourselves in the future, and when we have that that we can look at, then we can look at what we do around the clear. Thank you. Thank you. We have to do our level best, whatever is an action I'd like to ban, to try to make sure that those things do not repeat themselves. Okay, thank you. Okay. You got some extra time for your next question. You know, thank I, you. I'm going to give Maurice some credit because, you know, for her to be here tonight after dodging the all election, you know, I'm very thankful when you see that you're incumbent, as usual. We found that there was an investment, an invitation to Kevin Clark, and he decides not to show. Just like a bunch of times the incumbent had called the police on me just for campaigning near his office. But when it comes to nuclear, anything that will harm a mass among the people, anything that will harm people, even one individual, I will speak out against. You have to remember, in the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, Yes, I would most likely have a lot greater impact on you personally. We would be able to see that a lot more of your services are maintained, right? But me, I'm not concerned, you know, whether you're going to sit down here and spread the word and get us to, you know, get in a position to change this world. Because there is a federal by-election coming. And I can tell you, these individuals here try to cheat you. They try to decide to run a private election among these three politicians plus the other fourth wannabe. And we know that the fourth is not qualified because you just had a child. And what are you going to do? You're going to sit down here and choose your child and the people. It's a four-month-old child. So we know that individual is not fit to serve you. And Marissa, I'm not going to comment on anything else because you show a lot of guts to be here tonight because you knew that I would be here because the people have been robbed right through this election. I was a homeless man less than a year ago. And I went from a homeless man to forming the 14th registered political party in Ontario. And I became the first leader of that political party with four other candidates. And you all would have the nerve to deny a man who was ran in this riding four different times, three levels of government I faced, and you all had the nerve to try and run an election without letting the people hear from your okay. two candidates. Thank you. That's your time. Thank you. Well, Michael? Uh, Tom's policy would definitely be to phase out nuclear and to uh, be more proactive with uh, looking, thinking globally and acting locally. In Germany, even the Conservatives, Merkel has said, no more nuclear plants. And we should not be too proud to not listen to other countries across the, the world who have better ideas than we have as to how to create renewable and safe energy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for coming. Tim? Thank you, Charles. I bet you've got something to say. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Great question. Uh, the Green Party uh, of Ontario supports uh, phasing out nuclear. Uh, as well. We need to get off of nuclear. It's an inflexible energy source. It's a dangerous energy source. Um, many of you will know that from, from following the news over the last year or so. It's not something that we can do right away. I think the Green Party is realistic about that. This is something that will happen over a number of years. But I think that something that has to be mentioned, an emphasis of the Green Party is on energy efficiency and conservation. That's really the way forward. We have to reduce our consumption, we have to conserve energy, we have to invest in building retrofits to make it easier for homeowners to achieve that. That's really the approach. We have to invest in technology. This is the growth area for this province. Green technology, green energy. This is a, this is a chance for us to become leaders internationally. We have to look to what, what the future is. We have to invest in, 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 in innovative solutions for a difficult problem. This is one of the biggest problems that's going to be facing us in the future. Energy, energy prices are going to continue to rise. 
We can't be as dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, we have to. We have to act now. We're running out of time. And 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 really, the party that's going to deliver on this area is the Green Party. So I, I, I definitely also would encourage you to find out more on our website about this because we're we're really in depth on our on our energy uh, energy policy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Arisa. Okay, John. You have something you want to say? John. John's a trajectory. John. <laughs> All I want to say is, I would point out that all forms of energy carry risk and cost. All forms. It's not as though if somehow or other we get rid of nuclear energy, we have safe energy that's not going to create other problems. All forms of energy create risk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's move it to healthcare. Toronto General Hospital. Sir, do you have a question? I'm going to start holding on to one to the last minute. Thanks. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Because um, we have a few more questions we want to get to. Um, so Toronto East General Hospital is currently uh, slated to be renovated. It's uh, desperately in need of renovation. It's met with some um, stalling from the city. If you were elected as MPP, what would you do to ensure that that hospital is uh, Get the renovation it needs so that the patients there get the kind of quality and care they deserve uh, versus the, uh, the sort of 1960s um, state that it's in in some areas of it. And I think we're going to go in the, re uh, the reverse direction. And we'll start with uh, Tim. Uh, great, great question. That is, uh, that is my local hospital. I don't live too far away from there. And I've, I visited a number of times. Um, and I, I think we've all we all know the challenges of our of our healthcare system. The long wait times, the, uh, the shortage of family doctors. I have family members that have waiting been waiting for years to to, uh, to get a family doctor. We know that uh, the Liberal Party of Ontario has not delivered on healthcare. We have a plan which is focused on health promotion and illness prevention. So we have programs. We're going to be investing in this area. This is an area where Ontario traditionally has underinvested. We invest, in Ontario, we invest $7 per person in health promotion and illness prevention in comparison with British Columbia, where they invest $21. We have to support healthy lifestyles, healthy choices for the future of Ontarians. We have to make it easier for children to access healthy food. We have to support education and recreation programs in our school. Over time, this is going to take the pressure off our health care system. It's going to be a lot. It is a it is a longer a longer term process and a longer term vision, but it's important that we act now. At this point in time, now our healthcare system eats up about 50 percent of our budget. It's projected that by 2030, that could be up to 80 percent of our budget. We have to deal with these costs, and that will it, that will allow us to invest better in our hospital system. And obviously, we need to do that. It's clear everybody's everybody's experience has experiences in the healthcare system, and it's uh, we're not we're not satisfied. So um, yes, that would be the Green Party approach. Thank you. Thanks very much. Healthcare is a category, an area that I am just so proud of in terms of where we've come in the last eight years. We have done amazing things in this province with Ontario government. What have we done? We've gone from the longest surgical wait times in Canada to the shortest. That is a huge accomplishment. We have 1.3 million more Ontarians that have a family doctor now than they did in 2003. So these are great strides. Now the question was about the, the local hospital, Toronto General Hospital. Well, I spent time in that hospital. I visited the hospital, visited the CEO. That CEO is doing amazing things for our community with that hospital with very little support. The emergency wait times in that hospital have been reduced by 50% because of the great work of that CEO. That CEO has been really working hard on looking at the team support, the nursing support, and making it very lean and effective and efficient. So working with what he has, which is not much. So what I'm very pleased about is that there's been a huge commitment now in terms of infrastructure money for that hospital for a major redevelopment. It is overdue. And that is why having provincial advocation in this riding is so important for these kinds of things and projects to happen. What disappoints me is the conservative position saying about capping CEO salaries for, um, for uh, CEOs of hospitals. And I think that that would make our hospital really, really concerned. Because we have great leadership at that level where community hospital and it's up to those CEOs to really work hard with what they've got and I think ours is a fabulous job. 
So going forward, I want to see the redevelopment happen. I want to fully, fully support it going forward. This is our primary resource in the community, and we need to make sure we trust it and we can rely on it. Thank you. Okay, it's John. Well, I think the question had to do with what would you do to make sure that the East York Hospital gets the renovation that it needs. Well, the answer is obviously that you go to the health minister, make it clear how important it is both for the community and the health of Ontario in general, and cut a deal to get the money. Okay, I mean, that's the obvious answer to the question. Uh, I think I'm going to pass the mic and not give you my thoughts about the Ontario health system in general. Kevin? I've got oh, no deals. No, sorry. No, that's all right. You don't need the mic. It's like, it's like, it's like I'm back to play toy, just like my, uh, my three opponents from the political parties have been doing with you all through this election. Because the question is, how much debates have you all been to and how much debates was Kevin Clark invited to? And how come whenever Kevin Clark shows up, you all decided to call security and call the police when you were afraid of the people? Now, when Kevin, it comes, Kevin, when it comes, when it comes to your hospitals, when it comes to your hospitals, whatever you need for the greater good of all is what I stand for. And John Richardson, you can stand up as much as you like and decide to be the mediator between these three wannabes, but they don't serve the people. And I serve the people. Whatever you need for the greater good of all is what will be delivered by your next member of parliament. Whatever you need for the greater good of all. And I'll tell you something about the CFO. I can't guarantee you that that CEO at that hospital will be there because if one of these politicians would support that CEO, somebody must be greasing this guy's pocket because hospital CEOs are making over $300,000 a year. And that's a disgrace to the general public who needs health care and they need proper service in their health care and they need to see that the health of the community is maintained. So one cracker jack from your political party shouldn't be making 10 times what the people make a year. My candidate, Marty Poos, against Tim Hudak in Niagara, he brought up two kids on $14,000 a year, and he's on the verge of defeating Tim Hudak. He's the biggest talk in Niagara, because we are the people, the people, the people, the people. That's what my party stands for. Thank the you. people, not the Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael speaking for the only party. How's Neil doing outside? Is he okay? Thank you, Les. God bless. Thank you. The uh, only party, well, I think it's a bit of a red herring. I, I worked as a nurse for 35 years and uh, many hospitals in Toronto. And I believe that we don't, it's not a matter of money, it's a matter of use of our resources. There are many, 50% of people in acute care hospitals are bed blockers. They're waiting to enter a nursing home or retirement home. And I remember because many times, many years, in the summer, they would block off active wings in hospitals because the doctors are going on holidays for three months. Then there's nurse burnout. We have another new development in the hospitals where we are still keeping our RNs, but hiring RPNs that are just as qualified to do just as many things as RNs, but the differentiation in salary is $23 an hour for an RPN to maybe $45 for an RN. Why do we also fire at Bridgepoint Hospital? We fired eight, nine months ago, 230 personal support workers. I need just fire the CEO. So, you know, the... Yeah, there's just that uh, there could be much more house calls then, more nurse practitioners, more practical nurses, and cut out the middle. The RNs are now uh, redundant. Thank you very much. I think uh, Tim and I just wanted to provide a bit of clarification sure. uh, for the riding and look here. So we've had three uh, debates in the riding. This is the third. We had the one on Education Day, one on Barbara Tank and one today. And 
And uh, just to be clear, um, we have had Kevin and all three of them, and I think it's been great. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to, uh, there's a question here that sort of uh, it, it hits on what you were just talking about, Michael. I, you know what, we don't have time, sorry, absolutely don't have time. You know what, you already took it. Right now, currently, more than 50% of the provincial budget goes to healthcare spending. Would you uh, want to find efficiencies to control that spending, and if so, what would your party do? What specific policies would you look at to cut some of the healthcare spending? John, we're going to start with you. We're going to go uh, to your left and come back down this way. I think the answer to the question is the following. Leaving aside the debate of whether you want a public health system in Ontario or not, the decision to be made has been made that it's a public health care system. That means that everybody works within the system. That means that it's publicly funded. I see a major part of the problem being that doctors are able to carve up private businesses within the context of this and actually they're given billing numbers to OHAP. And so what they do is operate private businesses sort of billing the general public. And if you're, if you've made the decision as a province that you're going to have a system of public health care, everybody's in or everybody's out. So the first way to begin to control costs would be to make the doctors employees and part of the system and not allow them to run private business within the context of it. Thank you very much. So there's two sides of the coin. It's kind of like an energy discussion. We use our energy, but we also try ways to conserve our energy so we don't use so much. Same thing with healthcare. So we need our healthcare. When we're sick, we need the healthcare. But we also are looking at ways of how do we focus on health prevention, health promotion, so of course we don't need to use that system as much. So I think it's it's a two-sided coin when we talk about health. So where are we going on health? Well, I just want to maybe draw your attention to this little button. I don't know if you've noticed it on me. Um, it says I'm a healthy candidate. This is a, um, during this election, through um, the uh, Heart Soap Foundation, they have put forth an agenda to encourage candidates to make a pact that they're committed to health prevention and health promotion. I think that's a very important piece of coin that we look at. I think I'm the only candidate in this riding that has taken that pledge. So going forward as a party, where do we see doing this? Obviously, I talked about great efficiencies that we can learn from our local hospital that we have done in that hospital system, the hospital network. I think that's great work to continue. And on the area of um, how do we not have to draw the system so more, Let's look at our seniors. So going forward, we want to allow our seniors to get care in their home. That is a great way to make sure that it is reducing the cost. We don't need so many long-term beds. We have the care happening in the home. I think that's a very uh, great initiative. We're also looking at children, child obesity rates. What do we do to keep children active, to keep children busy? That reduces the obesity rates, reduces the health, uh, draw the health system from that. So those are two examples of how we can accomplish that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another, another great question. Um, and I think that there are uh, some commonalities in, in approach to, uh, to the Green Party and, and what uh, Marisa has spoken about in terms of our, our focus on health promotion and illness prevention. But another focus that we have is to refocus uh, some of the funding into family and community care clinics that are in local communities. We have a really integrated approach to health care, integrated with public health. Uh, working with, with a range of professionals from nu nutritionists to naturopaths to support doctors in hospitals. I, I have quite a few friends that I went to a uh, university with that are now uh, medical professionals out in the field and I know how hard they work. They need all the support they can get. Um, and, and our approach is, uh, is, is really integrated. It's really uh, a comprehensive approach which looks at the, the issue from many, many perspectives. Um, and we feel this is a real strength uh, for the Green Party. Uh, it's really about healthy, healthy livable communities that have the, the added benefit of, of supporting local farmers, uh, supporting local food, organic food uh, producers. Uh, very holistic approach. So uh, thank you, great question, and um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Your turn. Well, I won't say much because I have said it already. As we know, the single largest expense in the health sector are salaries. And I've explained how, from the RPN to the RN to the uh, to the uh, practitioner, nurse practitioner, there's a big gap in salaries. 
but a big equivalence in uh, proper health care. So when we have one of our val last fifth value is transparency, and if we have transparency, we have a lot less duplicity and waste in money. And uh, as a last statement, the medical supplies are way, way, way too expensive. Uh, wheelchairs and so on, AIDS. And I think that's a great tragedy to put on those who are too weak or too sick to uh, uh, pay for those items. And they are suffering.
who are here who gives the good workers of the union a terrible name because they are a part of this private union that they get guaranteed jobs and they get guaranteed holidays and these young people who are coming up don't have the opportunity where they're qualified for the job. But the fact that they have the qualifications, if you both have the same qualifications, you have the equal right to the job. But if you are a lazy ass, like the one who's not here tonight, which is the name I gave him on Rogers Cable, one of my opponents from the politicians, and, then you should not have the job. And since you're not going to give this other lazy ass a job for your member of parliament, why would you give somebody who's not doing the work you pay them for a job because they're a part of the union? You should be able to trust your government, and the people should be able to trust the government, and the government must trust the people, and the employees will trust the government, and they will serve the people efficiently. So we're going to get rid of lazy asses who are collecting Time. guaranteed wages that the taxpayers. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, John, you want to respond? And we're all going to have to leave. Yeah. 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 Get rid of politicians. Well, leaving aside that question, I, th I think you're right. God's yes. Yeah. Can you hold the microphone closer? Yeah, I, I think you're right in the sense that the issue is not getting better education. The issue is getting better people. And unfortunately, it was a very interesting article. It was on Monday in the Globe on this very topic, which may have been, in fact, in the inspiration for the question. But there's nothing about a lot of education that presumptively qualifies people for jobs. Uh, there are a number of human qualities, as Kevin points out, that are vitally important for that. And I think a part of the a part of what's needed here uh, is to get people to understand that education is not for the purpose of getting a job, but it's an investment in you as a human being. And you're going to take those human qualities and do the very best you can to progress forward in life, whether that's a job or something else. Thank you. Marissa? Thanks very much. When I opened my opening remarks, I hope I said this. If I didn't, I'll say it now. The way of the future is high scale, high wage jobs, high scale, high wage economy. And that's the way of the future. That is how Ontario is going to be, continue to become more and more competitive. And that is the growth for, for us. So what that means is, of course, we want to make sure we have those high skilled jobs available for people and that we have people properly trained to take those jobs. So I'm very, very pleased with what we've done so far. We have had the apprentices program. We are training more of our people into apprentices. We have a second career program. We're allowing people to retrain uh, when things change within the economy and, and their current skill level. We have literacy programs. So there's so many things happening to allow people the opportunity to be trained. We are also trying to get more people to do post-secondary education. So we're already graduating more from high school, now we want more to go and do post-secondary college or university. And that's why going forward we have a 30% tuition uh, credit in order for it to encourage more to be post-secondary. So now we need the jobs, which is why we're focusing on the job creation as well. And this is where the whole green energy, green technology um, is such a core of where we're going forward because this is where the high skill jobs are. And so as we bring more and more investment into the province, then we are able to create more and more facilities and that is only adding to jobs. So again, it's a two-sided coin and I see us progressing on both sides and I want us to keep moving forward in that way. So thank you very much. Thank you. And Steve. Thank you. Great question. Uh, I think that I have a real personal connection to this question. Uh, you'll see I'm the youngest uh, candidate here, and I'm the closest one to, uh, to my, my graduating period. I graduated uh, from the master's program in 2005. Since that time, tuition fees have risen considerably. My understanding is that under Dalton McGinty, tuition fees have risen by 30%. So my colleague um, uh, Marisa has talked about uh, affordable, accessible education and that this is a key to an information-based knowledge economy. I agree, but that has not happened. It's becoming harder for people to access post-secondary education, less affordable, more difficult, um, and we want to make that easier. We want to freeze tuition fees. Uh, we also want to invest um, in apprenticeship and mentorship programs in specific areas, make it easier for small businesses to become involved in these programs, and also to invest in some of the growth industries. So, so sort of, sort of to to uh, strategic targeted investment into what we feel are growth industries, green building, biomedical technology, 
clean and renewable energy. These are going to be the growth industries in the future. We need to create uh, opportunities in those areas, invest in those areas. Ontario has lost over 300,000 jobs in manufacturing, uh, I believe, in the last 10 years. There's been structural changes in our economy. We have to make these changes. And the Green Party, I think, has the strongest platform um, in going forward. Thank you. Marisa, anyone want to add? Respond? I just wanted to respond to two things that I heard. So one of the things I heard uh, was about uh, tuition going up. And I just want uh, people to be aware, and you probably already are aware, that um, the Ontario Liberals have made a significant investment in student aid over the last eight years. I think the student aid has increased by 56%. So it's quite substantial. What the government has also done has increased spaces. So there are more spaces to go to the university, and it's also provided operating and uh, capital funds for the universities. I do completely disagree with the position of freezing tuition. What that does is that just puts a strangle on the um, universities and colleges because they need to operate. They need to offer, they, we need to have more spaces. We're looking to have a higher, uh, more people educated college and university. And so if you prevent those institutions from growing by freezing their operating uh, dollars, then how do we have more people becoming educated? So I think that is really not the right direction, and the right direction instead is to just provide and is, uh, the Tom. help right now on tuition because that's an immediate benefit. Thank you. Do you want to add John? something, John? Yes. Uh, thanks. I get the impression, listening to an awful lot of this, that all the world's problems can be somehow solved by throwing money at them. Uh, I mean, all this suggests to me is that all this money that's been spent on all these things has in fact been wasted. Basically, the thing to do is, I think, actually the opposite. Not throw money at this stuff, but to encourage people to take responsibility for themselves. And one way this can be done is to lower the barriers for entry in general, and particular for immigrants, into a number of the professions. But I just want to remind you that the problem isn't having getting people into school. The problem is getting their graduate jobs. That was the because we have the highest percentage of postgraduates in the developed world. So I just want to know. I want to make sure you know that's the question. That is the question, and a large number, for example, immigrants are unable to get jobs because of artificial barriers to entry. The legal profession, the medical profession, etc. So, and given, if you accept that a large part of the problem is related to these people, and I believe that it is, then it's not a question of throwing money at anything. It's a question of lowering the number of barriers to entry. Thank you. Okay, uh, you know what? I want to move on. I want to do something, uh, before I give you a chance to uh, make your closing statements, we're going to do something a little different. I have two uh, questions I'm going to ask you. And I'm not going to ask for a long answer. I'm just going to ask for a yes or no answer to the question. Okay? So, would you be in favor of subsidizing IVF treatments for couples in Ontario the way uh, Quebec provides uh, health care assistance for in vitro fertilization? So, uh, I'll start with you, Michael. Would you be in favor, yes or no? Yeah, yes. Yes or no? I don't think it was Okay. Yes, John? No. Yes, <laughs> Marisa? I'll be very quick. <laughs> I, do, I do make the rules, and I can't have anybody change them. Honestly, I, if you have so to change them, the, yes. the answer is a possible yes, because there's a group of everything coming together to look at this, and the other side of the equation is the adoption. So it's and you look at adoption and okay. So you, yes, your answer is yes. You'd be in favor of IVF uh, uh, subsidi mm -hmm. subsidies. I'm in favor of the work that's done, which is looking at how we support both. Okay. Right now, if I want to get IVF treatments, I have to go to the bank and take fifteen thousand dollars out of my account, and I take it to a specialist. So you're either in favor of me not having to do that anymore because the government's going to pay, or you're in favor of me being responsible and on the hook for that. I don't care what the answer is, I just need to know if it's which it is. I leave it up to the very top. I have Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't think I heard the direct answer. This is a very serious, complicated question. I think it's inappropriate to say yes or no. 
very, very honest. There's a lot of work that's been done on this already. And the work is looking at families, which is adoption and IVF, which is why I'm saying that I am supportive of us moving forward on looking how we support both. Tim. I, I, I would have to echo uh, Maurice's statement. And to be honest with you, uh, making these sorts of uh, comments and decisions that, and answering a question like that, I feel like I have to be a little bit more informed. I don't want to make it. I feel like I would have to inform myself a little bit more to, to provide a more definitive well, answer. It's very simple. In Quebec, the, your, your, your OHIP would help support you getting IVF. Mm -hmm. It's an expensive procedure. So the question is very simple. Are you in favor of our healthcare system in Ontario covering that expense under whatever restrictions or guidelines they may be? It's pretty simple. Yeah. Uh, you can say, I don't know. I don't care. It's just a question. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I really think that I have to investigate that a little bit further, and okay, because I don't want to make a, I don't want to make a. That's that's yeah, that's, yeah. that's my honest answer. It's a very complex issue, you know, and I, and I don't want to to to. to okay. Great. I have another one. This could be more complex. Uh, pregnant women in every corner of this province have expressed their desire for for midwifery care, but currently Ontario only has enough trained midwives to meet sixty percent of the demand. So obviously we need to retain every Ontario trained midwife and growth profession. Would you be in favor of growing up the profession so we could support all the necessary um, clients that want midwives to deliver their children? That one's a lot easier to answer. Um, we had, uh, as you know, we had a baby four months ago. We had the support of a midwife. We had a home birth at home, and it was a, ex a tremendous experience for us working with the midwives. I was extremely impressed and I, I think that that's really the way forward. A lot more people are, are working with midwives and I would support that wholeheartedly, definitely. Thank you. Marisa? I think that within healthcare we're looking at different ways of delivering healthcare. This sounds like one option that makes a lot of sense to look at. Oh my god. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to feel uh, that you were missed. Yes, sir? Do you want to stand up and ask your question? We'll take this last question and then we'll wrap it up with closing statements. you 
on the local level, and in turn, all of you can come together and help me bring a big piece of mind for mankind across the world. Thank That's you. why I'm here. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Michael? Okay, well, education is not a cure-all. And I'm from the 60s, uh, you know, flower generation, and uh, I grew with Ivan Illich. We should get rid of all schools. And uh, what he, he called it, tools of conviviality. And we should turn, he called libraries a poor man's university. We should enhance the library big time. I used to go to, before it was called Ryerson University, it was Ryerson Polytechnical. Yes. If we're going to have education, it should be with a lot of labs and a lot of practical hands-on, and not hard house, high uh rooms to pontificate. So, and we now have, in the information age now, we have internet and the virtual reality, virtual, uh, Virtuosos in, in, in whether you want to study philosophy and so on. So again, because we talk about education, I used to be a landlord as well. We should have, uh, we're going to have uh, rent controls shouldn't be an answer, nor controls over freezing tuitions. We should at least we should subsidize our tenants and subsidize our students, especially welfare people. The landlords cannot afford to keep uh, the state's uh, people housing. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Jim? Yep. Great question. I have, I have spoken about this a little bit already, but uh, the Green Party plan is to focus investment on apprenticeship and mentorship programs um, and, and provide tax credits for small businesses to provide on-the-job training, that's really key. Uh, provide those sorts of skills for these individuals as they enter the workforce, on-the-job training, uh, and, and to make it easier for them to access these sorts of opportunities when they're coming out of school. And I think also we, we want to create a supportive education system that really welcomes, is a welcoming education system for all learners of all ages. So they can find their place in the education system, that they can succeed, that they can graduate, and to work with our schools on a local level uh, to, to support these students so that we can help them achieve and help them to make those next steps as they transition into, into the workforce. Thank you. I think the question was, what do we do about people that do not succeed to the education system? Is that what I heard? Or choose not to advance. Or choose not to advance. Well, I'm an engineer, which means the first question I always ask is why? And I think that that's a really important question. So why the premise of the question? Well, what is happening in the school system? Why would somebody, for example, not graduate? That's why we have a mental health strategy. That's why we have a poverty strategy. That's why we're looking at keeping children healthy. We're looking at healthy schools. We're looking at um, uh, bullying. So all of these things may be contributors to why someone may not succeed. We don't know until we ask the question, why? Then if they get through the high school, then the question is, well, what happens in the post-secondary? So if they're not proceeding to post-secondary, then the question is, why? And I think that as a level government, we've done a great job in terms of having skills training for people so no one is left behind. That's the goal in the day. No one is left behind. And I believe that that is possible, and I believe everyone has phenomenal potential in this province. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. a very difficult question. You know, the uh, former Los Angeles Lakers guard, Magic Johnson, once made a, uh, a very interesting statement where he said, you know, he was talking about kids in the inner city, he said, you know, all they really need is somebody to believe in. And that, I think, is the beginning of whatever the solution may be. So the question is, in what way, to what extent, can governments responsibly contribute to getting people to believe in themselves and act on it. I think you used the word mentorship. I think that's an important word. But that said, I also think we have to recognize that we're not going to have equality of outcome in our society. There is always, and this is not perhaps a desired outcome, but there is always going to be, to use your word, an underclass. 
We want to help as many people as possible advance beyond that. And the way I think, I think Magic Johnson went right on. What people need is for somebody to believe in. Thank you. And, okay. Uh, we're going to end with closing statements. Uh, I think we owe everybody up here a big round of applause for coming. You did a great job. Thank you for taking the time out to come tonight and to answer uh, these people's questions. And I know it can be difficult at times, but it is very much appreciated. And thank you to everybody who came down um, tonight to listen and to show your support for the, the process. And, you know, on October 6th, you'll make your decision. Uh, however, I'm gonna ask all the candidates to make a closing statement, and then, uh, I guess it's up to you, but probably if, if you would like to come up and speak to a candidate, I'm guessing you guys will be around for a couple minutes, and people can uh, speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. So, at this point, I think uh, we'll take a volunteer. Who wants to start us off? Okay. Great, you don't need the microphone, you've got a built-in one. Absolutely, as we know, it's on the ballot. The people are the first name on the ballot. And again, in closing, the people speaks first. The people, the people. Government should be about the people, not about my three opponents who decided to try and defraud the people. They decided to enter into an undemocratic process. I have been at these three for who knows from when since the start of this race, since the 13th, and I had to fight my way to get into every single debate. Except for the Rogers debate, again these three decided to isolate. So you decided to have three candidates debate among themselves, three politicians, and I'm thankful that they did. Why? Because I am not with them. I am not with the politicians, I'm not with the liberals, I'm not with the conservatives, I'm not with the NDP, I'm with the people. Now if you pick up a newspaper in Niagara this week, it talks about a man who brought up two children on $14,000 a year. This man has been publicized in three or four more Niagara newspapers. His name is Marty Poos facing Tim Hudak in Niagara Glenbrook for the people, the People's Political Party of Ontario, and they'll tell you that the party is headed by a well-known poverty activist named Kevin Clark. I'm a political leader, and I will follow you in getting your government back. That's the bottom line. Vote Kevin Clark and the people. Thank you. Uh, closing statement. Don't forget our five principles that Tom has. Uh, uh, best practice, empathy, frugality, interdependence, and transparency. Now we're a new party and we're going only have four candidates running. And it's hard to share the tie with such a crowded with 21 candidates in the province. So, one dream that could be activated by our party in four years if we get a majority government is to have top run 107 candidates. They'll all be native, aboriginal people. We could give the country back to the Indians. Just as Trudeau repatriated our constitution from England, we're going to repatriate our native land of Canada to those people who are the true land holders of this land and this province. And Kevin Clark will be part of that group if he wishes to. And so, and so uh, will you, because I'm with you. <laughs> so we do believe in affirmative action, as I said, and quotas to reflect cultural proportions. And uh, unfortunately time is up, there's more that can be said. I'm uh, proud that we are the only constituency that has a native school at Dundas and Broadview. I just say we get kicked Thank you. I'd just like to start out, and, and I know we've already given a round of applause, but I, I, I want to thank you all for coming out.
tonight. This is an important part of the political process, the local pro political process. I'd like to thank my colleagues here for, for participating in this debate. Uh, I, I noticed a theme that's come a lot, up a lot is, is a theme of responsibility. And I think that um, all political parties, uh, the other two parties that, uh, that are not attending tonight, had a responsibility to be here. Um, and I, I must say I'm disappointed, and I hope that you consider that when you're, when you're making your vote uh, for the decision. But again, they were not even there. They only came because they knew I was coming. So they decided to stay away. Oh, yeah. That's why. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I do encourage you to, uh, to find out more about the Green Party. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, this is one of the strongest ridings for the Green Party. We're a growing party. We grow from year to year. We're knocking at the doors of the other, what we call, old parties. With 11% of the vote provincially last time, 13% federally. We are one of the big parties, and you have a chance to make history if you vote Green this time around. This is a trend that's happening right across the province in the GTA. We're beating the PCs. We're moving out, and we're really connecting to voters in our, in our, in our focus on clean and renewable energy, affordable and accessible education, and, and, and grassroots democracy and responsive government. So at the end of the day, this really isn't about us. It's not really about me, it's about you. You have a choice to make, and I hope that you think hard about that choice and take into consideration some of, some of what you've heard tonight. Um, I think if you vote green, it's a smart vote, it's a strategic vote, and it's a vote that's going to make a big difference here and right across the province. Thank you very much. So I'm very honored to be in front of you as your Ontario Liberal candidate. Uh, this process is a wonderful process, and it would be my pleasure to serve you going forward. I think what's uh, important to consider this election is this is a serious time. You had great questions tonight. They deserve serious representation. Now, we did not unfortunately have uh, the other candidates here this evening, but very briefly, uh, with the PC plan, it's very clear there's a $14 billion hole in the plan. When we talked about it on Goldhawk, it very clearly was stated that if health and education are going to be maintained, there will be cuts in other things. Transportation, infrastructure, culture, children and services. The current sitting MVP said there are not $14 billion of waste in the current government. There will be cuts. The NDP have come forth in a very random way in this election. They talk about freezing tuition, and the question is, what does that mean for the operating and the growth of the universities? They talk about freezing transit, what does that do for the operating and growth of the TTC? They talk about taking HST off of the hydro in 2015. Well, that's after the next election. So they're telling us something now, what they're going to do in five, in four years from after the next election. I don't know if you're aware of that. They also are going to subsidize gas. It's a fossil fuel subsidy. If you want to move forward in a green energy and green economy, then why would the NDP be going forth and subsidizing oil? So going forward, you have an option in front of yourself to be a part of the leadership and the growth that we're moving forward. So as an Ontario Liberals, we have said that we're very committed to health, education, education, health, education, environment, and jobs. We're doing the work and we're going forward. And I need to just close with the quote from David Suzuki. I'm offering an endorsement of what Minister McGinty has done absolutely. This is a great plan. Any party would be foolish to talk about abandoning. That's his quote on the environment July 20th this year. It would be my honor and my privilege to serve the riding of Toronto Danforth going forward as your MPP. We need strong leadership, strong provincial leadership, strong representation, and I'm up to the job. It would be my honor. Thank you for your time tonight. It occurs to me the only person who's not received a round of applause tonight is, in fact, the person who's made this event possible, and that's Reverend Edith Ann Chance of Don Mills United Church. <laughs> that said, once again, I'll begin with I fundamentally agree with Kevin that this election is about the people in the riot and not about the political parties. The real question, though, is what's the best way for you to express yourself and to ensure that this election really is about you, about the future of this riding, 
future of this province and your own personal future. I do not for a minute believe that the way for you to achieve that is to vote for one of the mainstream political parties. I will end where I began earlier this evening, which is simply this. You either want representation or you don't. If you do want representation, you have to be willing to undertake the responsibility for making the decisions yourselves that are important in your lives. The McGinney government has done good things. It has done some bad things. But what it always does, it's an activist government that does things for you, too. You have no choice. It seems to me that this comes down to a very simple question. Do you want a candidate in MPP who will represent you and whose allegiances to you, or do you want an MPP whose allegiances to the party? Vote for it. We are done. Thank you very much. Just after 9 o'clock, um, I invite you to come up and say hello. Thank you. Let's see both.